So let me introduce uh, James Burnett, who's going to be moderating our panel discussion this morning. Uh, James is the editor of Boston Magazine, and he joined the magazine in 2002 after starting his career in New York, where he was a staff writer at George and a contributing editor at Jungle Law, the National Magazine Award-nominated law student lifestyle magazine. Good prep for an environment like this. His writing has appeared in Details, New York, Rolling Stone, Runner's World, and the British soccer glossy 442. During his two and a half years as editor of Boston Magazine, it's earned 15 city and regional uh, magazine awards, and the magazine's writers have three times been honored by the Livingston Awards for Outstanding Young Journalists. So please give it up for James Burnett. All right. Uh, thank you very much, President Schlesinger, and thank you all uh, for having me. I'm just going to go ahead and call up our other panelists so we can uh, get things started. And when everyone's seated, I'll give a quick uh, introduction, a little background on each, and then we'll proceed with the, uh, the conversation. Um, so Bob, um, Matt, and um, Andy, if you can come on up. I'll go ahead and start with Matt Lozon, um, who is a, a Babson graduate and the CEO of Paragon Lake. Uh, he founded the company in 2006 while a student here. And um, as his bio says, he chose Babson because of its reputation as the number one school in the world for entre entrepreneurship education uh, and leveraged all the college had to offer while exploring various business opportunities. Um, uh, the company was born when he and a fellow student uncovered a niche in the jewelry industry at the intersection of e-commerce and mass customization. Uh, and serving as its co-founder and CEO, he took it from an idea incubating here in a Babson dorm uh, to an institutionally funded company in just two years. He's assembled a leadership team for Paragon Lake that includes industry veterans from both the software and jewelry spaces um, and driven the growth of a national network of independent jewelers that use Paragon Lake's proprietary platform to drive made-to-order sales in their stores. In addition to building the team and driving growth, Lausen led the company through two rounds of institutional funding, totaling over $6 million in financing from Highland uh, Capital Partners uh, and Canaan Partners. Um, also of note uh, that while at Babson, um, Matt was an Arthur Blank Scholar, uh, was named one of America's top under entrepreneurs under 25 by Business Week magazine, um, won the Shelby Cullum Davis Prize for Social Entrepreneurship, and the John H. Mueller Jr. Business Plan Competition, uh, whose winner this year will be announced later on this morning, as I understand it. Uh, next to Matt is Bob Davis. Uh, he is general partner at Highland Capital Partners, focusing primarily on digital media and online ventures. He's been with Highland since 2001. Um, represents Highland on the boards of Bullhorn, Going, Hangout Industries, Name Media, Paragon Lake, and Quattro Wireless, uh, so both Matt and Andy's companies, um, and Turbine, among others. Um, uh, previously, Bob was a founder of Lycos, uh, which was, which went from a, sorry, it was the fastest IPO in, in NASDAQ history, mere nine months from inception to offering. Uh, wound up as a global media entity uh, and esteemed member of the NASDAQ 100. Uh, it was later acquired by Terra uh, Networks of Spain in a $5.5 billion acquisition. Um, and he then served as Terra Lycos president and CEO. He's been on the boards of John Hancock, Ticketmaster, um, Lycos Europe, a trustee for the Children's Hospital Trust Fund, the River School, board of advisors for Boston College Carroll School of Management, and Northeastern University School of Technological Entrepreneurship. Uh, he's advised the White House on matters of internet commerce and regulation, um, and has addressed Congress, the UN, National Press Corps, and the US Council of Foreign Relations. And last but certainly not least, um, he too is a Babson grad, uh, an MBA, um, class of 85. Um, pardon me. Finally, Andy Miller, um, CEO of Quattro Wireless, 
um, which is the world's largest premium publisher of mobile ad network. Uh, sorry, the world's premium right, <laughs> publisher of mobile ad network. Um, he was a member of the senior management team at MCube previously, the SVP of business development and strategy there, and he was instrumental in setting strategy and driving revenue for what became North America's dominant mobile aggregator. MCube was later acquired uh, by, by Verisign for $250 million in, two, in April 2006. Um, he's previously held the position of CEO for Watchpoint Media, which was an MIT lab interactive spinoff, uh, sold to Gold Pocket Hanberg Television in 2003. He's got a JD from Boston College Law School and a bachelor's from Union College. Um, so that's our group. After we wrap up and we'll leave some time uh, to take questions from the audience, uh, it'll be a group discussion. My first question is from Matt, um, specifically, uh, as the panelists, I guess, closest to our audience uh, for the most part. What, if anything, do you wish Babson had taught you before you set out into the world? I think we would have, I, I think it's really important to think about how you're gonna build a team. Um, I think so often, uh, I remember being in school and thinking that every other entrepreneur in the world was 23, working out of their dorm room and you know building some sort of high-tech startup. But the reality is, and being incubated at Highland and watching many entrepreneurs walk through the door and realizing none of them are 23, um, there's so much more to a team. And I think thinking through as you're building a team, you know, how do you make that transition from doing every bit of the business from you know, incorporating the business through you know, writing the code on your website, through writing content, to begin to think through how do you delegate to other people how to do all of those things. And I think that that's a tremendous transition to try to make as you begin to relinquish a bit of power give that to other people who can then go on and take responsibility according to whatever their expertise is. So I think thinking through more how to build the team uh, is very important. Is that the kind of thing that you could be prepared for in a, in a classroom environment or is that something that only real world experience can, can give you? I think a lot of people ask, you know, can you be taught to be an entrepreneur? I think the way that I think about it is, you know, if you're a great soccer player, it takes, you know, hundreds of hours of practice to think through where to stand on the field, what, to, what foot to kick with, who should you pass it to. And to me, Babson gives you all of the tools to think through all that so when you're out on the field, you're, required, you're using your instinct, you're using um, you know, what feels right in that time, you don't have to think through the mechanics or the fundamentals of it. Um, I think that all of those skills can be taught in a classroom. I think there are some things that are innate and probably driven by the personality or own experiences that you've had previous to starting the company. <coughs> And I should say, I, I guess we're going to have to fight over that one microphone there. But uh, <laughs> if at any point, uh, you know, uh, other panels want to chime in, I'll try to, to referee that and, and keep that happening. Um, Bob, I guess the next question would be uh, for you. Um, look, we have a sense of what the recession is doing um, at the macroeconomic level. We know what it's done to lending. We know what it's doing to consumer spending. But let's bring it down to the individual level. Um, how has it changed what it takes to succeed for the, inter for the individual entrepreneur? It's a, it's a great question. Before I even get to that, M Matt talked about uh, one of the things you could have learned at school in delegating and re relinquishing power. And on the topic of relinquishing power, you're engaged now, aren't you due to be married sometime soon? Because <laughs> I just want you to be very ready for that program because it's soon to happen in a way you hadn't imagined. <coughs> and to understand we've done nothing. <laughs> I don't know where to get a ring. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Matt's beautiful fiance, Ryan, is in the front of the room. Ryan, you can wave to everyone and say hi. <laughs> so uh, in any case, um, as far as the uh, market that we find ourselves in today, it's a very difficult one for sure. It's challenging because customers aren't buying the way they were just 12 months ago. Regardless of what business you're in, uh, it's, it's challenged. If you're growing very rapidly, you're growing less rapidly. If your growth was mediocre, it's less mediocre. If you were struggling, you're struggling more. It's an unfortunate reality of the market that we find ourselves in today. The uh, ripple down effect has rippled through virtually every sector of the economy. In fact, I'm hard pressed to find many that have been immune 
to what we've seen here. Uh, that being said, however, <clears throat> it's a great time to start a business. And doesn't that sound a little bit uh, uh, silly? But it is very much the case. Some of the greatest companies of all time were started in recessionary periods. If we start to look at what happened, G uh, GE was formed at the uh, Panic of 1873. It's a company that put on the map in one of the worst times ever. Hewlett Packard was started during the uh, started during the Great Depression. So some very very solid businesses that we found find for ourselves have all been put together in very very difficult times. And I don't think this is going to be all that different. From, an, from a venture capitalist standpoint, uh, it's a, as we look at entrepreneurs, those that have the courage and the fortitude to leap out today have a certain uh, staying power, if I can call it that, that is unique. And there's also the opportunity to break through the clutter today that is difficult to do in most of the times. If I jump myself back to 24 months ago when dollars were flowing wildly to most any company that would raise its hand, <clears throat> there was a lot of clutter. It was very difficult to find out who was really doing well because the dollars are so plentiful. In today's marketplace, the Darwinian principles take over and the, the strong survive. And what we are left with is, is companies that come out of this, come out of this malaise that we find ourselves in, to, in today, very strong and very powerful. So when, as investors, this is a, just a really wonderful time to, to double down, so to speak, on the, on the great companies around us. Andy, I guess I'm, the question, um I'd have for you, and it's almost in response to uh, some of Bob's remarks. You've worked with, um, with, with venture companies before. Talk to me a little bit about um, right now what that sector could be doing to support the startups, beyond obviously the dollars, but what we're going to need to get through this period. Okay, well, that's a bit of a loaded question. So I have Bob <laughs> sitting here who that's why, yeah, invest was on in my company, uh, who's <laughs> been phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> honestly. Um, it's interesting. So I, I kind of, just when Bob was talking, was thinking back, the first company I started was 1999. Uh, pretty easy to raise money. I, you know, was not very backable, but raised money. I had executive hair back then, so it must have been the reason why I got a, a nice check. Uh, but really didn't know what I was doing. And um, Bob was saying 24 months ago, it was pretty easy to raise money. So that's pretty much when we started uh, Quattro, a little, little bit before then. But uh, just raised money recently in, in the in the last five months, and that was a big challenge. Um, uh, going out on the East Coast, West Coast, Europe, looking for money, looking for the right investors. And the venture community right now uh, is, uh, I'm sure Bob could speak to it um, much uh, better than I can, but it's been, uh, it was an interesting ride, and folks have money. So it is a good time to start a business. There is plenty of money out there. Uh, there is just a, a certain number of, I, I would say, venture investors who've been sitting on their hands trying to figure out what to invest in, uh, what would make sense for them in the long run, maybe a little paralyzed by what the situation is. But there are plenty of companies thriving. And what they could do, what we could do as a community, and you know, I kind of look more as maybe the East Coast and the West Coast because don't have as much familiarity out with the West Coast. Um, but the venture community and the, and the entrepreneur community and the business community in New England is probably a little more conservative, <coughs> less friendly. I was actually at a, at a conference, at an award show, listening to Congressman Markey talking about how the West Coast was a nice hot tub and everybody would jump into the hot tub and share their stories and, and have their meet and greets and their after work uh, uh, sessions in uh, the Silicon Valley sort of crowd. And out here, everyone's afraid to touch. Everyone's afraid to talk about what they're doing and, and how they're doing it. And it's a little competitive. And um, the venture firms are pretty competitive. And the, and the money is, is hard to get. So uh, there could be a better uh, sort of atmosphere of fostering. Uh, collaboration. Uh, so we don't have the, the, the hot tub <laughs> dynamic. Uh, back to you, Bob. Um, as someone who's uh, been in the business community here in the Boston area, is a big champion of entrepreneurship and just um, uh, the local venture uh, and startup economy. Um, maybe some of the less tangible benefits of, of doing business right here, of being a startup and, and what that what advantages or benefits that, that offers? Yeah, I don't think there are less tangible benefits of doing business in Boston. So I'm, I'm a, you listen to my accent and you'll find out that I'm a local, <laughs> um, <laughs> born and bred in beautiful Dorchester. Now that I've, I've been successful in life, it's Dorchester by the sea. But, uh, <laughs> but, but um, uh, I, I really don't buy that West Coast 
is great mentality. Surely there's some advantages to Silicon Valley. It goes without saying. There's an entrepreneurial community. There's support from the government. There's, it's fostered there. But you know, on, on my left and right, I have two great companies that started in our backyard. 100% of my investments, my personal investments, when I say personal, through Highland, my investments are all uh, Boston-based businesses. Now, we're a global firm at Highland, and, and, and God bless my partners that are, that are trotting the, the, the world to find great opportunities. We have an office in Geneva. We have an office here. We have an office in Menlo Park and one in Shanghai. So we're investing around the globe. But from my standpoint, there, there are tremendous opportunities right here in our backyard. And it's, it's I, 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 I you know, respect Ed Markey's concept of the hot tub that where everyone can go and tuck, but I'm okay with you know, kind of sitting back and doing our own thing with our own entity because ultimately the success that you're going to generate as individuals is going to be driven by what you're doing internally. It's not going to be driven by the success of Google who's next door other than they're going to make it more difficult for you to hire entrepreneurs. Now I think one of the things that has made Silicon Valley the, the perception of Silicon Valley so strong is because we have a, a number, and, and you and I have talked about this in the past, James, they have, a, they have a, such a solid number of what I'll call anchor tenants. So you have the Googles and the Ciscos of the world that sit out there, large, powerful companies that, that breed many spin-offs. So you have this community of people that are coming out, but I don't believe once you've started it, once you get that business going, that you're at any disadvantage to get a business started here as opposed to on the West Coast. In fact, if anything, as I, as I mentioned a moment ago, I think the competition for talent is all the more intense. We have the, here with a university hotbed of, of all the great universities in, in the Boston area, such a, a great chance to bring out really quality uh, leadership into the companies that we have today. And uh, as I said, great people are doing that today. Matt, Matt and Andy are both building very successful businesses uh, here in our backyard. My companies collectively, again, when I say mine, the ones that I invested in through Highland, we probably employ you know, 1,000 people uh, or so, maybe, maybe 1,500 people in the Massachusetts area. And these are 1,500 jobs that didn't exist three years ago, all brand new jobs that somebody took. They were all created from nothing. And they, uh, they exist today. Uh, this next one will be for President Schlesinger. Um, you can think about it while the microphone uh, travels over. If you um, were advised, we'll, we'll put it as a, as a sort of hypothetical, instead of doing your job running Babson, you're running Massachusetts um, as governor. Um, as someone with this background, the first thing you would do, the single thing that you would do to um, foster the entrepreneurial economy here and to keep the companies that grow here from being lured by that by that hot tub on the uh, left coast? Well, there, there are three basic approaches to dealing with the issue if I happen to be governor of Massachusetts, which I hope not to be. <laughs> and Especially likely, not right now. Li likely yeah. not to happen, not right? Not right, right now. And, well, first I'll get toll collectors on the Mass Pike. <laughs> Clearly, there's a whole set of opportunities associated there. I mean, it is amazing that you can charge $7 between here and the airport and have nobody to collect the money. I think you've just so been elected there's an to your second term. There's an opportunity oh. there if I've ever seen one. Um, a platform is emerging. But, but the reality is to understand whether it be the nation or the state right now, the fundamental issue we're dealing with is a state of mind. And what you hear, have up here are three people uh, who have a state of mind that's uh, entirely focused on the opportunities that are available in a marketplace where other people are seeing nothing other than doom and gloom. And so the ability to be able to articulate a logic that gets people essentially off of uh, off of the mindset of doom and gloom and focusing on the nature of the opportunities that are provided by the environment is one whole part of the equation. The second whole part of the equation is to actually engage in large-scale activity to be able to assist people in the process of being able to think through what does it mean to be able to do things in an entrepreneurial fashion. Um, so one of the ways in which we've talked about it, academics have have a, a, a phraseology when they talk about entrepreneurship called necessity-based entrepreneurship, which essentially means finding yourself a job. Uh, in the context of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the overwhelming majority of the entrepreneurs that we have are from the Massachusetts uh, Entrepreneurship Monitor, which is done here at Babson, are 51 years old, generally of an immigrant population, and people who've engaged in entrepreneurial opportunities to find themselves work uh, in the absence of traditional employment opportunities to recognize that that is going to be a considerable lifeblood of the base of the economy right now, uh, and that we ought to be engaging in large-scale education in support of those activities would be the second thing I'd be worrying about. Uh, returning to your actual day job, um, as you work through this, you, you, there were remarks you made earlier uh, about the, the way in uncertainty has increased, uh, and how we're operating in a time when um, 
the parameters are shifting uh, what we know, what we don't even know we know, to sound like our ex-Secretary uh, of Defense, um, has changed a great deal. How are you reevaluating, uh, or to what extent are you reevaluating what Babson provides its, its students? Does, does the skill set change? Um, do the tools change? Is that an open question? Or? Uh, well, I think the, the answer is and one, the, the issue that the faculty is dealing with and grappling now as part of the broader community of Babson is how do you augment the traditional business plan oriented, causal oriented skill set that has served us very well over the last 30 years in process of defining entrepreneurship and providing opportunities for people through traditional access to capital and building teams and all the things we're talking about to recognize that some of the assumptions that underlie that model have been turned on its head. You know, the assumption of cheap energy turned on its head. The assumption of easy access to financing turned on its head. The assumption of an abundant skilled labor market turned on its head. So if you introduce new assumptions in an increasingly uncertain environment, the issue becomes one of what are the skills that you need to develop in that environment. No, the critical skill, the most critical skill you need to develop um, is in fact one of a mindset. Um, we've been playing around with over the past several weeks looking at things like the, 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 uh, the historical derivation of the phrase entrepreneurship. So in the literature over the last 30 years, everybody's accepted the basic premise that entrepreneur comes from the French, okay? uh, where all work activity seems to start. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it turns out, okay, at least according to one organizational professor, organizational behavior professor at IIT Madras in India, that, uh, that in fact the phrase entrepreneurship is defined from the Sanskrit, entrepreneurana, uh, which means an inner urge and a state of mind. And to some extent what we're really talking about is capitalizing on the inner urges of applicants that come to this school and kind of combining it with a state of mind to energize activity in a world that Bob has already defined it as loaded with opportunities while most of the other people in other institutions are sitting around worrying about problems. Matt, one thing, um, I guess and this actually is something you, you share in common with Bob and that was the uh, speed with which you were able to turn an idea into a functioning company. Um, two years in your case, we had the, the nine months to IPO. Um, so this, I'd like you to weigh in on this as well. In, in very practical terms, what are some things you can do to build momentum? And this would apply to any startup, but again, when we have inertia in the economy, a sense that the, the world doesn't feel like it's moving forward in the way that we are accustomed to, how can uh, a founder keep things moving and, and build that, that critical momentum? So to first correct, I don't think our company has been nearly as quick as Bob's. <laughs> but I think the importance, particularly in this environment, is focusing on building, number one, a, a sustainable company. Number two, making sure it's a sustainable business model. I think, you know, I wasn't around for all of those days, but I think gone are the days when you can sort of build it and they will come. I think you have to figure out how are you going to make money, focus on that, and prove that you can do that, and figure out in a short time frame, how, what are the economics of your business, uh, what sort of the reproducible sales model, reproducible revenue model, and then if you're going to get funding, go out and do it at that point. Um, I think better yet, don't get funding. You know, find a way to fund your own business. I think the vast majority of entrepreneurs never take uh, a dime of institutional money. I think uh, in that Economist article that we're talking about, um, most entrepreneurs take it from friends, fools, family. We talk about it here at Babson. So I think if you can find a way to fund your own business, that's hands down the best way to do it. Um, I think the reality is that probably doesn't translate to quickly getting a company off the ground. It's not a quick process to build a great company. I think even Lycos you know, took some time to, to, to build. Paragon Lake certainly will take some time to build Quattro. I don't, I don't know where you guys are heading or what the exit strategy is, but I think you're probably building a company that can live long and prosper on its own. So I think that that is um, very important. So perhaps framing it that way is even, isn't the best way to go, to talk about speed being the goal um, as opposed to sustainability needs to come first. It's good, it's good to know, Matt, when your next finance that comes up that you believe in, you believe in self-financing, so I can remember that. <laughs> I'm, gonna give you the, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to live your dream. I want you to know that. <laughs> um, you know, I, <laughs> I, uh, I wrote a book in 2001 that you can find in any antiquities dealer around the 
Commonwealth today. It was called Speed is Life. So I'm a, a believer in uh, acting swiftly in the marketplace in most everything that we do. I think that uh, fast is always better than slow. It, it doesn't mean it the area of, it doesn't mean be reckless. It doesn't mean be foolish. It means that we live in an environment where competition is moving all the time. We want to be decisive, we want to be swift, we want to avoid analysis paralysis. We want to have good business judgment that is always overlays it, but we don't put, put ourselves into a state of perpetual planning, which so many uh, businesses often are capable of doing. <clears throat> that I can analyze something from every angle, and you know what, after all the analysis in the world, which is appropriate, the analysis is appropriate, I'm not, I'm not trying to suggest it isn't, but after all the analysis in the world, there is rarely an answer that is so black and white that says this is what I must do. It's ultimately good business judgment, it's intuition, that says follow it, and I think it's important that we accelerate the process. What you can be sure of is when a good idea hits the marketplace, there will be copycats. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are, there will be something, somebody that's doing something similar. Uh, there will be another uh, equivalent to Paragon Lake. I hope not nearly as successful as we are today, but someone will try to do it as soon as Matt continues to get traction. Andy runs the uh, largest mobile ad network in the world for premium publishers. And for sure, there are copycats out there today and will continue to spring up that are trying to do the same thing because they see an opportunity to make a buck. And if either of these guys were to sit back and, and take it easy and take it slowly, we would give the, the competition opportunity to not only catch up with us, but to surpass us and leave us in the dust. It's a, it's a very, very dangerous place to be. So I think acting uh, swiftly is real, very, very important in the, in the area of, a, of an entrepreneur. And, and you know, back to Matt's comments, because of course as a VC, I'm not doing my job unless I tell you about better source of funding mm -hmm. than self-funding. But in reality, in the marketplace today, 10% 10, 10 of jobs in the U.S. economy, 9.8% of jobs in the U.S. economy are VC-backed companies. That represents 18% of the GDP, which means we're backing higher paid jobs as well. So an amazing piece of the workforce today is, is driven by VC-backed activity. You're right in the sense that you can back your own business, but I would, say, I would suggest that most large successful uh, startups out there were not personally backed. They required venture capital or substantial institutional capital because it's tough in today's marketplace to get a money uh, a business going with small money. It takes a lot. It takes millions of dollars to, to, to succeed. Andy, what's the total <coughs> financing we've raised at Quattro thus far? 28, 28 million dollars for a company, and I would guess, I don't want to predict the future for Andy, I would guess there'll be additional financing raised in his future as well. And that's the magnitude of what it takes to get a business moving and off the ground. And, and Matt uh, raised six million dollars. So unless you're coming from the Rockefeller family or the Gates family, it's a really difficult thing to do. And I think you make the danger back to speed is life. I think the big danger you make as a, as a young entrepreneur is saying, well, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this and avoiding that step into institutional capital and you put yourself behind the eight ball because you're trying to push it for too long and you're just trying to hold back and you can't put your foot in the accelerator because you don't have the resources. You can't hire that one extra person that you need. You can't buy that one extra computer that's necessary. You can't get out into the marketplace and find customers the way you should. And that's, a, I think, a, a, a dangerous place to be. So not because I'm in the business, uh, uh, I, but I believe very firmly that institutional capital is a great way to, to go and to do it very early. And I would say to tag along, ultimately we at Paragon Lick chose to take institutional capital. We originally planned to raise angel financing. And I think we said there's a huge opportunity here. If we take a, lo a, a smaller amount of money, it's going to take us too long to get to that goal. So we wound up going out and raising the VC, building the team, and getting sort of the luxury of able to move fast and capitalize on that opportunity, which I think is very important to note. Um, I had a question for Andy in terms of, uh, we're talking about um, the importance of speed and, um, and also uh, what competition can do. I mean, you're in a very, uh, it's a hot sector to put it one way. Um, the biggest player but not the only one. When you talk, when you think about the balance of how much time you focus on um, growth and long term, and the day to day of managing something that's still very new, how do you how do you juggle that? That's a great question. So we are in uh, a pretty crowded space. Um, and sort of backing up the point here, we were one of the last ones into the uh, mobile advertising space. Uh, I think before sort of the window on funding closed, and companies really got a, a ground uh, hold on uh, publishers and advertisers and, and a stake in the market. So it would have been very challenging now to come into the space. And if we didn't have 
the financing we, uh, we did at the time and gone as fast as we, as we went, uh, we probably wouldn't be around today because we were starting to see companies that just didn't have the financing, didn't have the plan, didn't execute well, already falling by the wayside two, three years into a market. Uh, but we're constantly, especially being in mobile, constantly thinking about the future, uh, which in mobile happens very quickly. So mobile's like a dog year. In one year, things change so fast. So in, in three years, we've seen the iPhone happen. We've seen the Android uh, platform. We've seen applications. Uh, we've seen our space just get on TV every single day with Apple putting ads for the iPhone and people going to the mobile web, whereas uh, when we sat with Bob three years ago in Highland, it's something we never would have imagined that we could draft behind. So we constantly have to think about what's the next platform, what's the next handset, what, what's the next segment that's going to enter mobile. Uh, and it's a it's a day-to-day -day, uh, gig, that's for sure. So the key with that is, is the team and putting together folks who um, work on the day-to-day -day and folks who can help on the, on the future and, and, and at the same time have a group who are really executing and moving the business forward. What's, uh, can you give me a little bit of your sense of, um, I guess both on the philosophical level uh, and then more practically, how you evaluate talent and, and, and how you do, I mean, it's, it, that's something everyone on this panel um, has in common, the need to get the right people. It's not the easiest thing to do. It is true. There, and, uh, I was thinking about uh, the panel, uh, uh, driving in and thinking about starting a company and some of the words of wisdom I got. And I started, my first company was uh, with a, a student who was a senior th um, at MIT Media Lab, he did his senior, senior thesis at uh, MIT and we licensed his, his, um, his senior thesis as a product uh, to, to build a company and raise some financing around. And so this wasn't like someone that I knew for years or my buddy from school who I wanted to start a business with and we were sort of thrown together. And this was not someone who you know, wanted to wake up at 8 o'clock in the morning and go to work. This is someone who wanted to wake up at 11 o'clock in the morning and you know, watch Jerry Springer for a little while and then maybe come to work. Uh, and there's, you know, there's rule number one, right? So you got to pick your partner who's got the same work ethic as you, who has the same idea of what he wants to build with a business, what exit they want. Some people want to build a little nice lifestyle business. Other people want to build the next Lycos. And if you have a different dreams, you're going to clash. You really have to start with folks who um, know who's the boss, who's making the decisions. That's a big one. Uh, definitely pick partners who have different skills than you. It's great to you know, be a real uh, mind meld with your partner, but if you have the same sort of business development uh, mindset, then you're probably going to have troubles on the product side and, and other aspects of the business. So it's important to have that sort of baseline. Uh, and then as the business grows now, you sort of, we really look at integrity. We have a big integrity screen here. If there are, uh, you know, life's too short, the business is too quick, everything moves so fast. If you've got a bunch of folks who are whiners, who are gossipers, who are just busy spending time talking about internal things, it's just not worth keeping them around. No matter you know, how valuable they are, they're going to poison the well. So you've got to make your moves quickly uh, with folks who just don't work out. But you really need to look for people who are passionate, who are interested uh, about the business, who are interesting to other people, and uh, who really want to learn and grow a business together. Hopefully you hire the right people in the first place, and so it doesn't come to a situation where you need to let somebody go. But how do you know? How, uh, that's got to be one of the hardest things, I think, for a new manager, a new boss. Um, and as a founder, that's what you become when it's time to, to fire somebody. Yeah, you, you can't let it go too long. You know, you know, unless you're, you're desperate for the position or it's in a market like 1999 where it's so hard to find folks. You know if someone's not going to work out. And the key is just to cut it off right away. Because especially in a startup where everyone has stock in the company, you owe it to everybody else to make sure that there's not someone who's sticking around here, who's bringing everyone down, who's lowering the pool, who's not working as hard, who's coasting along, or who just doesn't have the skills. Uh, because we're all in it together, we all own the company. Bob, when you're looking, uh, you're obviously looking at the, at the business plans um, when people are coming to you, but you're also looking at the talent um, behind them. And talk to me a little bit about your screen and how you, how you read that when someone's coming looking for funding. Yeah, it's not a lot different than what Andy just took you through. When we invest in a company, we look for three things. And this is the order, which is surprising to many, but we look for people, markets, products in that order. First and foremost, top of the list is people. And as an entrepreneur comes into our facility, facility, they'll sit down and bring out their computer and want to take us through PowerPoint after PowerPoint of what they have. And we'll say, hold on a little bit and, and tell me about yourself and where you're from. And somebody will usually start with their last job. And I'd say, back up a little further. And they say, to where? I said, maybe to the day you were born. And <laughs> we'll get through with someone where they, were, where they were, where they were raised, what they did in high school, what they did in college, what they studied, uh, uh, what the decisions they made, and really want to hear 
hear about from somebody. We want to hear the passion in their voice, and that's a big part of it. We get into well into discussion before we're talking about the market and the product that they have. So that that better mousetrap is not. Uh, the most important thing that, that's to us. <clears throat> and then it's such a subjective thing anyway when you say what makes a good person. Well, what's a good person to me is different than what's a good person to you, but, but I have my criteria because, because top on that list, a high on that list is chemistry. And you might be a wonderfully talented entrepreneur, uh, best that the country has ever seen, but we might not be right for each other for any number of reasons because when we co-invest, which means when you invest your time and your effort and your resource in such a big part of your life, and we invest our capital, we're going to be working together for many, many years. And it's important that we can get along. It's just not worth it for you and it's not worth it for us uh, if we can't. So that chemistry is a critically important component. Uh, someone that has a passion for something, a passion for the business, a passion for a hobby, passion for a sport, passion for family, someone that you can really hear that, that just burning uh, love for something as part of them is, is important to us that we, that we see. Someone that wants to succeed for the sake of success. Now, there are a lot of reasons to want to be an entrepreneur, and the financial trappings are surely one of those, but, but even more so than that, that person that wants to put their name on the map that says, I did it. I fought the odds and I won. And that's a, that's a quality that we don't always see, but it becomes uh, very important to us. As we start to look at people, and, and Matt and I have had this discussion uh, more, than, more than once, as we look at people that we say we're hiring into companies, one of the things that is always important for us is we want, a, we want an energy catalyst. And an energy catalyst means, and you all have seen them, and you've all seen the inverse of that as well. And an energy, energy catalyst is that person, when you're walking down the office and you're walking by somebody's cube, and there's somebody there and you say, oh, I want to talk to them. And you walk a little faster. And you want to talk to that person about whatever project you've worked on, or whatever happened this weekend, or whatever took place. That is a person that just radiates the energy and you build on that. And the inverse of that is as you're walking down and someone pops out of their cube and you turn around and walk the other way, you start to pick up your Blackberry even though it didn't ring and pretend there's a phone call there. That's not the person that you want is, is part of the team. And then lastly, we want a person that, that believes that they are going to be whatever the role is that you're hiring for. We want a person that believes that they are the best or will be the best that exists. I am the best CEO in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I am the best Java programmer that exists in all of the country. I am the best salesperson that we could ever find. And a person that believes that with that take no prisoner attitude that says I am going to be it becomes a magnet. That's the type of personality that, uh, not in an arrogant, by the way, egotistical way, not someone that goes around pounding their chest. That's not what you want to see, but someone that believes it deep down. The person that's bragging about it, get out the door as quick as you come in. But the person that believes it deep down, that that's what they are doing, either they are or that's what they're out to, out to accomplish, is that winning attitude that's just, just so important. Matt, you're, you're grappling with this talent question. Uh... In a, in a different way, and we touched, I think you touched on it a little bit in the answer to the first question. I did a little reporting um, before we started here and I talked to one of your, uh, your old professors here at Babson uh, who gave me the scoop that you're, you're looking to, to step aside um, and to do a transition at Paragon Lake. Mm -hmm. How do you manage that process? You're the founder talking about now hiring the CEO. You're entrusting your baby, literally, with someone. That, that's got to be a, a kind of a fraught proposition, and how have you worked through that? I think you manage the process by managing the process. Uh, one of the first things Bob and I talked about when we came to Highland was, you know, how do you feel about hiring top quality management team? And if it came down that the, there was the right time to bring a world class CEO, would you do it? How do you feel? I think most people feel like that would be an awkward conversation, but frankly, it wasn't. I, my personal feeling boils down to three things. Number one, if you believe that a great CEO brings A-plus talent into every single person on the roster, and we do. When we get new people, we make sure that they pledge that they're going to be the best at whatever they do. Why wouldn't that extend to the CEO? Um, and the way I look at it is, frankly, it's probably the right thing for the company, right? Uh, somebody coming in with more experience, who has the pattern recognition, has seen this situation before, is more likely to make a good decision. And I know to date, I've been able to overcome a lot of uh, situations, tough situations, by putting in more hours, having great advisors, many of which are in the room right now, uh, but that only gets you so far. So having the opportunity to bring someone in who's done it before, which we have found the person, they have signed a contract, and they start next month, and 
I think when everybody sees who this person is, everybody will be very excited uh, about her background and what she brings to the table. Number two, I think it, it, if you manage the process, going back to the original question, um, I think there's two ways. If you're going to build a high growth company, it's your first time doing it and you're young, so if you're here in, in school, more than likely there's going to be a time where you or your investors or your board are going to want to bring this in, in this person. So you can one, fight the process, or two, you can embrace the process and realize how great of an opportunity it is. And I think that allows you to meet all of the candidates, that allows you to apply filters such as could this person be a mentor? Can this person manage the board? Can this person instill the values that I believe in as we build an organization? And I think the third thing is, in my own situation, a lot of the other founders I talked to um, were technical founders. So either they identify as serial inventors, uh, they identify as uh, true technical people, they want to be the CTO, they don't want to worry about the business thing. In my case, that's not what I want. Uh, what I want to be is the best CEO in the world. I'd love to start another company and see it all the way through, but the way I look at it is, do I want to learn that on my own dime, on my investor's dime, on everybody else in the company who has shares dime, or do I want to sit on a board with and work alongside a world-class CEO who's done it before? And ultimately, the decision we made, and I think you hear a lot of horror stories about you know people going out raising financing, all of a sudden somebody gets forced in, I think it goes back to chemistry. Bob and I have always been on the same page. The other people in the company have always been on the same page. And the opportunity to bring in a world-class person uh, wasn't a question. Um, President Schlesinger, for you, it, it works differently still. Um, you're evaluating talent and the, the promise and potential in applicants, uh, whether it's undergrad or uh, for the MBA program. But then you only have them for four or, um, or two years. Talk to me about the, the habits you hope um, you're able to instill uh, so that we get a kind of lifelong learning is that talent can grow regardless of the environment uh, in, the, in the workplace so that uh, builds on itself over a lifetime. What we have to do at a college level is logically derive from the conversation that we just had here. Because what you heard here from the three folks, uh, all of whom got significant venture experience in terms of the dynamics of, of an early stage venture is uh, assemble the team carefully and slowly and cut the cord quickly when it becomes obvious that someone's not going to fit. Um, and, uh, and that generally is exactly the opposite about how most of these ventures actually get developed. In most of these situations, we romantically get attached to people for one reason or another. We like them, they get excited about one thing, we bring them onto the team, and then we're enormously frustrated about their inability to provide the level of support that you expected, but we can't cut the cord. And so the first issue is, are you really thoughtful up front about the process about how you bring people on? So you think about it as a college. You have a requirement above and beyond all of the obligatory um, aspects of, uh, of an admissions process to recognize at the core that you have some of those fundamental uh, variables of passion and inner urge that Bob was talking about here. All we can do, and so be clear, all we can do within the confines uh, of an educational environment is really kind of sharpen those capabilities, sharpen those orientations, put a skill base alongside that passion, uh, and help people to build the networks that are necessary for them to go forward. I think probably you all will have better questions uh, than I do at this point, but I wanted to ask one more. Um, I've, been, I've been putting several of you in, in hypotheticals, um, so I'll let you ask a question back to me. If there's anything that you want to hit on uh, before we open it to, uh, to the floor. So we have two microphones, one uh, there and the other one there, and uh, someone needs to be brave and, uh, and ask the first question. This very distinguished panel, these great entrepreneurial minds, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity uh, to pick their brains. Good morning. Um, I'm Marco Moreira from uh, Harvard IT and founder of uh, PeopleHopper.org, which is a nonprofit that empowers individuals to cre create their own community service causes on the social web. Uh, and my question is to Bob. Um, PeopleHopper has recently applied for your summer at Highland Entrepreneur Mentorship Program in the hopes that the company would consider the application uh, based on the current social issues that are going on in the country right now as a result of the economy. Uh, 
Do you believe Highland as a company would be willing to consider social responsibility as part of its investment strategy? So summarizing, would you be interested in investing for profit or nonprofit on social enterprises? Well, the, the answer is yes, uh, if it's for profit, because to be clear, and I make uh, no bones about this, we are investors in, in enterprises that will create financial value. Uh, our charter in life, our role in life, is not to solve the social ills of the country. If we can make money while we do that, that's what we would do, but we would not invest in something that serves solely a social purpose. Our limited partners would not support that. We would not do that. The Summer at Highland program that he referred to is, is really where Matt and I first met. It's a program that we've launched, I guess, each of the last three or four years where uh, college students, undergraduate and graduate students, are encouraged to submit a, a business idea. I wouldn't call it a business plan, a business outline to us. And for that, they will be provided a summer stipend, meaning you'll be paid some amount of money for the summer to work on your idea. Your idea comes with no strings attached. You're not obligated to have Highland fund it. You're not obligated to stick around. But you prov you're provided with a facility, some mentorship. You, you work with like-minded entrepreneurs that will sit with you. And off we go. We will pick, uh, there's, no, there's no fixed number we will choose. We had this year the applications we just sent in. We had 205 applications from 75 universities around the country, eight of which uh, came here from Babson. I wish I could say you were top on the list, but a couple of local schools uh, uh, beat you by a bit. But uh, nonetheless, you're up there in terms of the number of applications submitted by any, uh, by any one university. But, uh, and we will choose anywhere from zero to five companies out of those 205. There will be a vetting process where we'll look through them. My guess is out of the 205, we'll ask 25 or 30 to come in and spend a little time with us. We'll narrow that down to a number, and the number will be based on those individuals that we feel end up having that right passion and the right people, uh, the right market opportunity that I spoke about uh, earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob, you mentioned something there, talking about do you want the students at Summer at Highland to have a business idea versus a fully fleshed out uh, business plan. What's the right point to bring in outside expertise before you show your idea to the world? Yeah, well, for the Summer at Highland program, of course, it, it, it's, its idea is, the concept behind it is it is a mentoring program. So an idea isn't expected to be vetted out. In fact, frankly, for most students, that's a, not a realistic concept. Matt, in my opinion, has been a great exception in terms of the, the wisdom that he brought to the table at such a young age with the company that he had. But it, it's, a, it's, an, it's a concept. And we look at Summer at Highland as a, as a way not necessarily to finance a business, although if we do, as we did in the case of Matt and another company that came out of that same uh, class that he did uh, in the West Coast called Affine, that's wonderful. But if nothing else, it's a great way for students to be exposed to us and us to be exposed to students that hopefully someday we'll work together and our paths, uh, our paths will cross. That's what the uh, program brings for us. As far as the funding timing, when, when we might look at a funding or how far a plan would be. I, I think the idea, we want to be protective of our concepts, but in reality it's difficult for, even if we were so inclined as an industry, if we, if we were so malicious that we wanted to go off and steal ideas, uh, what we back and what we invest in, as I mentioned before, is people first. Uh, people markets products in that order. So. The idea that you have is yours. You have it, you've thought about it, you've cultivated it, you've developed it. And to hear something and say, I'm gonna go find someone to do the, the same thing is just, just never happens. We back people. Uh, it's rare that we go off and say, rarest of rare that we would go off and say, here's an idea that I have, let me go find people to develop my idea. Uh, it's your idea that we bring forward. But more than that, what we look at for venture money, in my opinion, is what you're getting far more important than the capital is you're getting a partner. You're getting a new employee of the company. You're getting someone that will work for you. You're getting someone that will leverage their own relationships, their own networks, their own know-how, their own wisdom, their own mistakes that they've made to the benefit of the company. We at Highland are very active investors as opposed to passive investors, and we're proud of that. If you're looking for a firm that will write a check and come back uh, at every board meeting, and that's the last time you'll see them, that is not us. We will have a view and we'll express the view, but we ultimately want you to run and lead 
the company. But I think that that in, in some of the some of the uh, best companies we have today are from second, third, fourth time entrepreneurs that have made plenty of money. They don't need the financing. What they come back to the table for for venture capital dollars, they come back to the table for that relationship, that partnership, that mentoring, that wisdom that, that you can bring to bear. Um, this is really a question for both Matt and Andy. As you're weighing the input um, of people with more experience, whether it's the venture firm you're going to or just outside advisors that you're soliciting advice, balancing that um, input, everybody's got opinion, sometimes um, conflicting advice with your own gut instinct and your own knowledge when, when you're young and you're, you know, what they have uh, that you don't is experience. Yeah, sure. I mean, everyone's got an opinion, and uh, we have a colorful board. Sometimes more than one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with Bob on the board, it's hard not to be colorful, but we have a board of folks uh, with very different backgrounds and skills. Uh, we have a little board of advisors. I have my own personal advisors, and ultimately the decision is mine and my management team. So uh, we're, we're the closest to it. We have to take all the, the inputs in and, and make our own decision. Uh, but that is definitely the key to get lots and seek lots of advice. So I entered advertising, still in the mobile space, but I didn't know that much about advertising and just tried to seek out everybody I could to, to get opinions and figure out where we should move. And I think if you don't do that, uh, you're going to have a lot of trouble. And, and one little caveat to that is we, Bob's uh, people and markets and uh, product, definitely true because we were funded and changed our plan, what, uh, eight weeks, seven weeks after we started. And, uh, you know, walking up to Bob and saying, hey, remember that business you funded six, seven weeks ago? Well, we're going to go a little bit <laughs> different direction and waiting, waiting for a response for about an hour for him to say, all right, I like this one better anyways. So that's, you know, that's really what it's all about. Matt, was there a time that you had to say to, to Bob, you know, that's, that's a great piece of advice, but I got to go this way instead? But there have been, I think, many a times that that's happened. I think there have been times where Bob equally thought that the direction I was going in was uh, not the right one. But I think one of the benefits to working with a partner who is investing in people and not an idea or a market first is that ultimately they trust the decisions that you're going to make. Uh, I think we, you know, one of the ways that I've learned to work with uh, people within our company as well as our investors is transparency, being very straightforward about pros and cons. When issues come up, talk about them, uh, and that way there are no surprises. I think when there are surprises, that's when there is an issue. When you don't stick by what you pledged that you were going to do, there is an issue. Uh, I think on a similar topic, which is really important, when we were getting the company off the ground and we were still in school, uh, we relied heavily on advisors. Many of our best advisors, like I said, are here today. Um, I think one of the things we learned, or one of the early mistakes we made, was every time we had a question was pinging everybody in the audience, you know, asking every single advisor. And ultimately, somebody is going to be upset. Um, so I think we learned very early on to manage our advisors um, and understand who should we ask about what. And when we had a particular type of question, ask the particular type of person and get that feedback back. But realize that if you take advice, um, you know, being open and honest that it may not be the be all end all and how you ultimately end up acting is important. Otherwise, I think uh, relationships can be strained. And at the skill level, what you have going on here is really quite important. I mean, you have two people who are clearly articulating that they're maintaining an outside orientation towards getting advice. At the same time, they understand that they're ultimately accountable for making the decisions. So the question becomes one of how do they continue to communicate with advisors like those of you that are in the room or those that they have uh, who end up feeling honored and respected to be involved in the process of offering up advice, who feel listened to as opposed to ignored. Regularly, folks are coming into my office with ideas on every day of the week, and they have zero interest in listening to anything I want to say <laughs> other than your idea is wonderful, you're wonderful, the world should rain money on you. Um, <laughs> And, and I would you know my kids. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say it is, uh, you know, early on when we were getting the company up and going, we were still in school. It is very, very, very dangerous to listen to every piece. You know, you've got to listen and absorb every piece of advice, and ultimately that's going to shift your opinion. But to act on every piece of advice is is dangerous, particularly when you're talking to investors. Every investor you talk to is going to have a different uh, idea of what the optimum business model is. Um, so I think going back to you know. Get as much advice as you can. Understand who the advice is coming from, but ultimately you've got to act on your own instinct because I think that's what has gotten to you, you to wherever you are. I want to go back to the uh, audience. Thank you for being patient. Sure. Hi, I'm Maria Simono. I'm a Babson grad, 98. 
And um, I feel like I've been in the industry for a long time and we really um, are seeing things that we've talked about for 20 years, starting with the internet. And you know, we really are at the beginning of, or you know, well into the digital revolution. So you know, I feel like software as a service is something we've talked about for a long time, cloud computing. And I'm curious, um, Andy and Bob, um, you know, where, what do you think the 10,000 level view is of mobile and something else we talked about were network specific applications or network um, specific devices and with um, the Kindles of the world coming out, what you think the future is there? Well, I think mobile is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> And, and scary and unbelievably interesting for an entrepreneur because I, we think of ideas and things we'd like to do every day, which uh, you know, you, we can't do. But uh, you know, I'd ask you a question. So we're a mobile ad network, and we handle uh, every device you know, out there. Uh, we serve ads in just about every country of the world. And I looked up uh, yesterday versus six months ago what our top three devices were in the world that we, what we serve. Uh, adds to, and um, it, pretty ironic or shocking that the two of the top three aren't phones anymore. So in the span of six months, uh, we went from serving to Blackberries and Motorola phones and Razors. The number one phone is the uh, the number one device is the iPhone, but the number two device is the iPod Touch. The number three device is the PlayStation, the PSP. We now serve ads onto into Wii devices, into DSIs, handheld gaming, uh, Garmin, uh, Garmin, TomTom, -tom, uh, directional uh, navigational devices. It just continues to explode and change every day. So I think the opportunities uh, to get involved in app development for, uh, for the phone, uh, in, in mobile banking, in commerce, mobile commerce, all the things that we've seen on the wired internet but taking a twist on it onto the wireless internet uh, is a huge opportunity. I know obviously Highland and other folks are looking at it. But by the end of this year, more people will access uh, the internet on a mobile device than on a PC. And there's already way more mobile devices than PCs and TVs combined. So from an uh, entrepreneur uh, opportunity, I, don't th I think the, the opportunities there are endless. Yeah, I have to echo that, unfortunately, but maybe not unfortunately echo it. But, <laughs> but you know, I'm asked all the time what the next big thing is. And the next big thing is the yesterday's old thing. And that's exactly as Andy said. It's the mobile device. It is the power of that is mind-boggling as to what we'll see. Uh, by a show of hands, who does not have a mobile device on them today? So there's uh, two, three people in the room brave enough to raise their hand, and all of us have a mobile device. And if this was 10 years ago, maybe one or two of us may have raised our hand. And what's powerful is the device for most of us three years ago, and for many of us still today, was just it was a telephone, and that's the sole purpose it served. But increasingly now, with every day there are more of us that make that leap, that telephone that's in your pocket is, your, is a principal, if not a primary source of data. So you're getting sports scores on it, you're getting stock quotes on it, you're communicating it. If not via email, surely with text messaging, with communicating with one another. It is becoming the central hub of computing uh, in, in, the, in the environment today. And as the technology continues to, continues to advance, that becomes more important. One of the challenges of mobile uh, computing, if I can call it that, in, in what in the problem that Andy solves is that with so many different cell phones and manufacturers and so many different cell phone companies such as Verizon or T-Mobile or Sprint, it's, it's difficult for a publisher of content. So if you're the New York Times or Boston.com or, or Yahoo to have it look presentable on this tiny little screen you carry around in your pocket. Because it looks different for all of them. They all have a different little format. Well, a big piece of what Andy's company does is it takes these websites and it works a magic sauce, throws it in a bucket, and it comes out on your cell phone and it looks very presentable. So he has the some of the biggest brands in, in out there where he creates their content for them with technology. The NHL, the NFL, Boston.com, Univision, Blocky Remix, Playboy, uh, and many others where Andy produces, I say produces, takes their web content and puts it in a, a format that's acceptable to a mobile phone, regardless of whose phone that is that you are carrying. Now on top, and that serves a big, big demand for a publisher in the marketplace because that's a big task and for the most part 
I don't know how to do that if I'm publishing a website. It's complicated, it's complex, and to try to do it for everyone is, is difficult. Now the next step in terms of when he says he's an ad network, the way he makes money after he's done that is he'll put an ad on that device with the publisher, and they'll all share in the profits that come from that ad. So he'll lay something out, he'll, 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 the uh, New York Times will put a uh, piece of content out there, the ad that will be on your cell phone is something that gets served by Andy's company. But we went from zero two years ago to uh, what, what, how many p impressions are served now a month or a day or whatever? Two to three billion a month. So two to three billion cell phone views of data a month coming through Andy's company from zero two years ago. And I would venture to guess that if we're in this panel, if we're invited back a year from now, we'll tell you that it's 12 to 15 billion a month. And a year from that, we'll tell you it's 50 to 100 billion a month in terms of impressions being served because mobile is changing the way we do everything. And the fellow that asked the question earlier about social causes, well, to me, uh, more so than the, uh, the $100 laptop, Mobile is the great equalizer that conquers the digital divide because as we start to look at accessibility of mobile content, that's what we can really get out into the farms and the hills and the valleys as we start to spread information. That mobile device is what we find. We may not have a television in the home, but we can have a mobile phone that we're carrying. And this is, to me, the first great promise of uh, access to information everywhere. Do we have a question from over here? Yeah. Flip a coin for it. Toss a coin. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm George Stasis, an undergraduate student here at Babson College, and uh, I, uh, my question is to Matt, if you could uh, sort of fill us in a little bit on the mindset of the entrepreneur. Uh, you talked about your company and, at the, and the stage that you're in and that you've uh, looked and you've hired uh, a new CEO. Uh, you've talked about um, the fact that you're bringing in somebody who's world class, who's done it before. Um, you talked about uh, the fact that your skill sets are probably not appropriate for the stage that your company is in now, um, that you're not going to be learning on your dime. It's all very rational and detached, um, or so you present it to be. Um, I just, um, my question is, does there have to be something else? Like, do you have to lose interest slightly in what you're doing, or do you have to gain interest in something else in order to really let go? Thank you. Well, it'll be interesting to answer that question a year from now. My, my gut instinct is no. Uh, I'm very passionate about the company that we're building. I think that every role in the company is important. And I don't imagine that my role will diminish. Um, I think we're going to bring somebody else. Now, the flip side is I don't believe you can have two CEOs. And I won't be the CEO come May 18th. Um, I think it has to be very rational. You make very difficult decisions every day. Uh, and you make many of them. And most of them can e very easily be emotionally charged, whether it has to do with letting somebody go, whether it has to do with hiring somebody, whether it has to do with how you deal with an issue you're having with a customer. I think you have to look at the facts and make the right decision. Uh, as far as you know, the skill set, do I think we could carry forward and I could keep running the organization? I'm sure we could and we'd still see some success, but I think it's looking forward and saying, where are we going to be two years from now and how difficult would the transition be at that time? Um, I continue to be very excited about the company. I think that we will have great success and uh, come a couple years from now, I'll be very excited about where we stand. You know, it's interesting. I, I'll, I'll just a couple of comments on this, but, but first, if you uh, take probably the greatest technology wonder of our time, Google. Who can tell me who runs Google today? Someone, holler out a name if you know. What name do you associate with Google? Do you know? Fellow at Asuka? No, you're, you're, you're too smart for us. But most people identify it with uh, Larry Page or Sergey, the technology founders. You're correct that Eric's the CEO, but, but the names that are far and away more common with the average individual are Larry and, and, and Serge, that are the Googles. Uh, and these are the guys that put it together. And by every definition, it's their company, as Paragon Lake, for the rest of time, is Matt's company. And what Matt has done as a young entrepreneur, by the way, isn't unique to being a young entrepreneur. We find that at many stages of a company's life, it requires different individuals for different skill sets. 
the, uh, the person that's a great knuckleball pitcher isn't going to be always your best fastball pitcher. I mean, Tim Wakefield's a great example. Can strike batters out all day long, but can't throw a ball over 80 miles an hour. And a company needs someone different from zero to 20 million in revenue than they do from 100 to a half a billion in revenue. And the guy that ran a half a billion dollar company is very unlikely equipped to run a $20 billion company. If you put me in, who have had some success running a business, and tried to put me in to run a, a, a General Motors, or I don't know, some large behemoth, I would be lost. I would be absolutely lost. I'd be the last guy in the world you would want to put uh, in, that, in that role, because we're all equipped at different stages. Uh, and what we find is different development. But that doesn't take away, in my opinion, doesn't take away the passion. And the greatest entrepreneurs are the, those that have the ability to surround themselves with that leadership that's necessary to drive success. And I think most importantly, listening to the conversation and the question is don't think of passion and rationality as existing on the same continuum. I mean, this is an intensely passionate person who is displaying a rational thought process of the most optimal role that he can play in the business at a given point in time. It doesn't link to a reduction in passion. I would, I would elaborate that on that a little bit. We're going to analyze you here, Matt. <laughs> and, I would say that it, and I would also say that it's, it's a passionate decision. What is important for all the reasons that I talked about earlier, what we look for, is Paragon Lake succeeding. And that's a passionate decision as well, that we want to find the company growing, successful, my mark on it, all the great things. And anything you can do to, to make that happen is what drives a, a, a great entrepreneur. We had another question from this side. Um, I have more of a VC-based question for Mr. Davis. Um, you guys raised $300 million in 2007 uh, for your consumer fund. And um, considering how the economy is going, I was wondering how you went about raising that, uh, those funds from investors and how you plan on, um, on getting money from new institutional investors. Specifically, how are you positioning your fund, your VC fund, against other funds in the same space? Well, our consumer fund is a side fund. That's not the core of, of what we do. Our, our main fund is called Highland Fund 7, which is an $800 million fund. And the one before that is Highland Fund 6 is $800 million. We manage a little over $3 billion in terms of total assets. When I say it's a side fund, we hired in as a partner of ours the founder of Staples, uh, who is also, I believe, a member of the uh, Academy of Entrepreneurs here. Uh, Tom Stenberg was the founder and CEO, uh, came on uh, to work for us for a couple of years after he left Staples. And then uh, he, along with one of my ex-co-workers uh, at Lycos, set up the Highland Consumer Fund. The idea behind that is they invest in retail consumer concepts. Um, they are a mid-stage investor, which means they're interested in a company that has uh, no concept risk, but execution risk which means if you show up with an idea on the back of a napkin that says, I can create a new product that will cure whatever it might be, they're not interested. If you've developed the product and you've shipped it and your first customer has bought it and it's very early and you need capital to grow, they're interested. If you want to establish a new retail store to sell paper clips, they will be not the guy to come and see if you're looking to sell the first paper clip. Once you have three or four stores and the unit economics of a given store are proven, they will be uh, uh, interested. So that's the model of, of what they do. They raise money at a, uh, I say they, they, we. We are uh, co-owners of the Consumer Fund uh, and carries our brand as the Highland Consumer Fund, but it is an individual, a separate entity than Highland Capital Partners, uh, of which I am. Um, so uh, they raised the money at a very good time, at a very good era than we found. Venture money was plentiful, as it is today. But maybe more of a present challenge is that we are out in the marketplace today. We announced Highland Capital Fund 8. So the core fund is out uh, raising a fund. I can't talk about that because of regulatory requirements, but I, uh, but I would say that the, uh, but raising a fund in any market is a challenge, but those that are successful will do well with it. Is there another question from this side? There we go. There we go. Um, one of the interesting things, my name is Matt Johnson. I was a uh, fast tracker and uh, graduate in 2008. And um, I'm now an entrepreneur, uh, early stage, obviously. One of the things that I've read and, and about to experience as I go out uh, with my concept was uh, the fact that the seed stage or the zero stage funding level, uh, which was, you know, in between friends and family and the angels, you know, angels have gotten very sophisticated and they're really acting like VCs and VCs are by nature 
trying to get things that are a little bit farther down the road. And I just wanted some feedback from anyone on um, ways that you know there can be better access to funds. You know, Spark Capital's just got their convertible loan program that they announced. That they're not the first one by any means. Um, but really getting that zero stage uh, funding with you know fifty thousand to two hundred fifty thousand dollars just to get something going, so that you can approach you know Bob Davis later on with something that's got some traction. It's not just a question of approaching us later on. It's approaching us now with the right idea. We are very much zero stage uh, investors. Matt's company, the initial financing was fifteen thousand dollars. Andy, the initial funding was zero. We provided him a, a computer and a place to, to set up a desk for couple of months as we contemplated uh, funding and he worked out of our office. So uh, we very much do zero save. What I described on the consumer fund is a very, very much a retail oriented business. At the main fund of what we do, uh, we're stage neutral, uh, which means we will invest in a, a, an individual with an idea that wants to work out of the basement of his or her home, or we'll invest in a later stage growth company that requires $50 million in capital. We often provide small sums of money to individuals, small sums of money. The, the uh, s uh, entrepreneurs that work with this summer will be receiving fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a piece uh, as a group, as a team, uh, in terms of total capital. That's about as small as it gets. We regularly fund, uh, we regularly seed businesses with quarter of a million dollars, half a million dollars as somebody vets through an idea. We regularly bring people on without an idea fully vetted. So we bring into Highland, uh, we call it an entrepreneur in residence. So we'll bring in a, a smart, bright person that we have a love and a passion for, that we can feel their own love and passion for, for succeeding. We'll bring them in to work with us as a, as a paid independent. But the idea is to blossom your idea or blossom a thought. Don't know what it will be, but I know you're a good entrepreneur. Come and work at, with us at Highland. We'll provide you facilities, computer support, whatever you might need, and spend six months or spend a year coming up with your, your great idea as to what a business might be. And then, if you're interested, we'll provide uh, financing. But we won't guarantee we'll finance the company, and you won't guarantee you'll let us. But you'll come in and we'll, uh, we'll look at it. Do you think, as a follow-up, do you feel that there has been a, a bit of a, a dry up in that that area, that seed area? I, I know that you've provided some. I, I, I don't. I, I can't speak to the angel community of friends and family because I'm not, I don't participate in that. But as far as the activity that we're doing, uh, I don't. I feel, if anything, just the opposite. That it is a, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, there are some amazing companies that are going to be built starting today. This uh, recessionary economy is, is a time where people will break through in a way that we can't imagine. And if we can fast forward the clock uh, five years from now, we'll be looking at We'll be talking about the next Google that started in 2009 without question. There will be some big companies that break out during this period. So we are active seeders of businesses. We will continue to be. Great. Thank you. Yeah, we've got about five minutes left if anybody else has a question. Hi. <clears throat> I'm Mubashir Khanzada, part of the Saltire Foundation. I have here come from Scotland. Um, my question is to the panel and perhaps also to include um, James in it. You talked about being the best and um, the best CEO or the best entrepreneur. My question is that how do you measure being best? How do you know when you have become the best and, and continue to be best? And what are the essential um, sacrifices or costs that the entrepreneurs must be willing to pay um, for becoming the best, and do you have any regrets when you were going through that process yourselves? Thank you. At an early stage, the process of being able to define yourself or your concept or your idea or your team against the best requires you to be very rigorous around who you want to benchmark yourself against. I continuously find myself against larger companies that always kind of have an aspiration of being the best for the consumer with the best products and the best space and the best management team. And as long as they continue to evaluate themselves against a collection of mediocre competitors, um, life is very good. Uh, so the issue becomes one of can you in fact set some absolute targets that are extraordinarily high that enable you to actually benchmark yourself against the standard you want to be able to hold to yourself uh, and also give you that target to actually motivate yourself to actually get to that level. Uh, taking a different way, I think one thing that's important when thinking about how to measure uh, yourself and your company is what are we and what are we not. I think it's really important to say, it, it, as important as setting a goal that you can achieve and your company can achieve and early on as an entrepreneur you personally can achieve, uh, I think it's very important to say what aren't we going to do and that will help you focus. 
uh, I think early on, uh, when it's you know a company of one and you're trying to get something off the ground, a lot of best is happening up here uh, because you're going to have over and over and over again. People are going to say, "No, you can't. That's a bad idea. There's no way that's going to work. Uh, you're too young. It's such a bad economy. Whatever it might be." And you're going to have to convince yourself that you're the best. And I think it's a fine balance between um, believing that and not boasting about it, like Bob talked about. And I know in our company, one thing we talk about when we're hiring people is we're hiring people who want to be part of a winning team. You know, they see winning as a currency. Um, going to work every day is exciting for them because they're beating challenges, they're meeting challenges, and they're part of a winning team. So I think for us, we measure ourselves, are we the best at keeping our company uh, winning? Uh, and you know, it's vague, it's not uh, as clear as maybe as it could be, but I think it helps us stay on track. Thank you all for the questions from the audience, uh, introducing those last round of provocative topics. Thank you, panelists. If I'm correct, I think you'll give us um, the programming notes about what comes next. And uh, once again, thank you very much.